Okay, so we are supposed to start with basis risk, right? We have covered all these topics. Base asset, terms asset, everything, all this stuff you already know. Okay, we've done hedge transactions. Now we are supposed to go on a basis risk. We've already covered, we haven't followed this exact same sequence. We've covered types of hedging programs. Decision, no, we are actually working on decision problems. We haven't finished all the decision problems, right? That's where we were, okay? So let's go to this and see. Right. So we were at, I think we were basically showing where we stopped last was, where we were showing you why um, the futures, uh, this is just a listing of decision problems and then we are talking about our actual, our actual solutions and discussions uh, with respect to these decision problems as they um, apply to the management of a passive risk book right so here we were talking i think where we stopped was we showed you why we established why uh when you're talking about this buy sell decision there's another decision sub decision within that that is what instrument should you use okay i mean uh, depending on the instrument that you're using which is a separate decision problem that in the case of futures okay leaving aside the other instruments in the case case of futures the decision with respect there's an additional decision problem with respect to expiry because which is what is the expiry of the futures contract because as you know that their futures contracts have multiple expiration dates that much you know already if you just look at crude oil futures you've seen that um, they have multiple expiration dates so the question of buying or selling a futures contract will immediately lease uh, once you solve the decision to buy or sell uh, you will obviously have to also deal with the decision with uh, with respect to which which contract month are you going to buy or sell right is that clear to everyone so that decision remains yeah as you can see here many many different months that are quoted for futures contracts so which con which month are you going to sell or buy so that's the decision and we showed you why that decision is an active decision okay not a passive decision they're not there they're not to be found okay fine no no worries no worries you told someone else okay all right okay so um so is that point is, is everyone clear about where we were we showed you where why why we say that the decision with respect because remember what we are discussing here in this module we are discussing with respect to each of the decision problems which you're already familiar with we are discussing when you start applying them to the context of a uh, passive risk book which of the decisions get automatically solved and which of the decisions have to be actively solved by the hedging team is that clear you understood that's where we are right so in the case of this in the case of a passive risk book you saw that the buy sell decision is automatically solved you remember that yes yes because in the case of in the case of a passive risk book you already have underlying positions right you already already have a bunch of underlying positions so your buy sell if your underlying position is long when you're managing a passive risk book when you're running a hedge portfolio you you already know that if your underlying position is long your uh, your the side of the market or, or, uh, that you're on is you're always looking to sell because your underlying position is wrong remember and because in hedging the philosophy is to reduce risk so the moment your underlying position is long so we're just doing a little bit of a recap i think some of you are still not clear from the expressions that i'm looking at that uh, in the case of the of the of managing a, a, a hedge book okay a hedge portfolio uh, the, the buy sell decision problem is automatically solved depending on which way your underlying position is the hedge the decision will always if your underlying position is long your buy sell is always decided as sell okay automatically solved but certain sub problems within the buy sell which is what we were looking at here within the buy sell we have some sub problems depending on the kind of instrument that you have chosen and your previous decision problem okay in the solution to the previous decision problem you may be dealing say for instance if you're dealing with futures uh, you will have a problem of expiry date which expiry date to choose that decision problem is actively solved okay why because it allows for the possibility i think some of this might have been covered in the post class discussion with tarun okay some of it might have been clarified for 
further so play and remember that you have to watch the entire video right so not just uh, what is there in the class so if somebody comes and asks a question and I answer that question and that's captured in the video that's part of your syllabus as well okay so the reason we said that is because of this where are we with magma I think this is where we will put our uh, futures calculations in fact Tarun pointed out a mistake I had made in the formula yeah, TK. Mm -hmm. so, so. <laughs> so. All right. So uh, the remember we had discussed the stack and roll. Please go back and uh, uh, re find find that calculation. Where is that calculation? I need to find that. <laughs> Okay, I know where it is. I think we did that in the, uh, uh, yeah, we did this here, okay, remember? So the, the mistake that Tarun pointed out at the end of the class is that obviously you have to take the, uh, uh, I mean, you, have to, you can't fix the reference here. It has to be on a cumulative basis, right? So what happens is if you're following a stack and roll system for hedging, okay, this is important to understand for futures, hedging with futures contracts because it's a very common technique. So stack and roll is used when you don't have, when you have a whole bunch of exposures, okay, running right down the future strip, you've got a whole bunch of exposures running several months out. And we discussed the case of uh, Ryanair hedging jet fuel for five years okay so uh, you, you may not have adequate liquidity as you can see here first two months is much more liquid these are the volume numbers first two months are much more liquid than four months but sometimes you'll get liquidity here as well so in case you have a problem of liquidity in the far months you would stack all your exposures which is what we showed you here and so the name this the expression stack and roll comes from the fact that if you have exposures all the way here in different months everyone's following an airline is operating is planning to operate for the next five years so every month they're going to be buying or every quarter they'll be buying some jet fuel they know how much they have to buy typically i mean they can make some reasonable assumption based on normal volumes okay so typically you would be hedging core volumes so that this much volume you know you're going to have so you hedge all that you can project your requirements and you want to lock in because you are actually be buying when you do the when you're conducting the business if you don't do any hedging the way you normally buy is you would typically buy on a spot basis that this month we need this much so you would buy this much crude oil. you will contract to buy this much crude oil you would be buying very close to spot on a spot basis but if you are looking at spot say three years from now who knows what the spot price is going to be it could be a lot higher right but you will actually be buying on a spot basis so what the hedging team does is basically it locks in the price by running a hedge portfolio even though when you actually buy that jet fuel you'll buy it three years later on a spot basis right but and so that price could be anything but if you can lock into the futures price and buy it now buy futures right now you are essentially locking remember remember the other principle that we established that when you do a transaction when you do a hedge transaction the price at which you do the hedge transaction that locks in the value of the underlying position at that price remember that we saw that transaction we discussed that the other day right we looked at we put up a crude oil chart here and then we talked we, we demonstrated that please go back and revise that these are also these are all <coughs> general principles that you can use uh, when you are trading actively which you don't want to reinvent the wheel all the time or, or go through the entire logic but you should know why it works okay so the general principle is that when you are hedging at a particular whatever your hedging uh, uh, rate is that is a rate that you have locked in for your inventory or whatever else your purchases whatever you're buying right so please make sure you understand that principle okay so you can see this big jump in the oil price you follow the news the US has taken out a top Iranian commander it's a very very big figure actually it's like taking out the head of the ISI uh, so it's a very very big this guy was very instrumental in Iraq and other parts of the Middle East so you can see that this particular from a technical point of view you can see what is the significance of this move this previous high has been broken can you see that 16 September 2019 that high has been broken so from a technical point of view also this is the, and this because you should always when you're looking at markets you should look at all these aspects okay so if we assume you know we're not really sure whether this is the low or this is the low it's not very clear but if you assume that this is actually lower than this okay then you have a low here you have a high here you have a low here this low is higher than this low remember that 
so when you see markets uh, watch markets and the adv advantage of looking at charts is this is all objective information all all this information 100% objective so you can see here that you've got two lows one higher low okay second low higher than the first low and you've also now got until then until now you didn't have it but just now you've got this move okay just over overnight and you've got this new high which is higher than this high are you fine are you following so you got two you got two uh, lows one is higher than the second one is higher than the first and then you've got two highs the second high is higher than the first so you've got the establishment of an uptrend are you able to follow this now you can say you have higher highs because you have two highs with the second higher than the first so this is a trick that you can use to uh, at least assess the state of the market at least you can see over this period an uptrend has developed and that is an objective assessment because you have got higher lows and you've got higher highs until now you didn't have until say five days ago you didn't have the higher high but now you have a higher high so you've got this uptrend developing okay so when you look at markets use this kind of logic as well to assess what is happening from a technical point of view in the market so if somebody is very bearish at this point of time uh, well they could be right but you have to assess that as a very low probability event because you've just had the establishment of an uptrend from a technical perspective right so you have to watch it from every perspective you're not just fundamentals but technicals as well Sir, yeah this we are talking about this one yes yeah 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 so what are you saying what am i not doing such uh, uptrends are very rare so we cannot actually rely on this. no 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 there's nothing when you are if you are looking at the market from a technical perspective okay all the fact is that the price moved because if you remember the price moved it did move it did shoot up after the Iranians struck the Saudi oil facility okay uh, and then at the same time if you remember after that it actually went back down below the point where it was when the attack came so all price action is as long as it's validated as a proper price action sometimes you get spike you get spikes and bad data in the feed which is quite rare these days but if the price is validated as a proper traded price okay if the market has traded at that price that is valid that is no less valid than any other trade and that's not to be invalidated by what caused the price movement we are not really concerned as from a technical perspective we are not concerned with what causes the price movement we are only concerned with whether the market actually traded at that price or not whether transactions took place at that price or not that's all so from a technical perspective we don't really care remember technicals don't technicians don't care about why the market is moving in this way the point is that the market has moved and it has traded at that price okay because remember that always the other thing that you'll see which is what makes uh, fundamental analysis quite difficult in many situations is that the market will always not not always going to react in the same way to the same type of uh, positive or negative fundamental news right you would have noticed this in stocks you will find when the stock has great earnings in a particular quarter the market will sometimes react well to this i mean the will bid the stock up on great good earnings but the same stock next quarter's earnings they may also be very good earnings beating expectations but the stock might actually decline because they will now focus on the outlook well the out the earnings are great but the outlook is poor you know the companies give guidance right companies give guidance that how's our next quarter looking and next few quarters looking so the same so the market does not focus consistently on the same set of fundamentals that is basically that is essentially what makes fundamental analysis very difficult to practice okay not that technicals are easy but technicals do not rely on all these kind of inferences okay in the case of fundamentals you are relying on inferences that the market will behave rationally that if the earnings are great then the market will buy the stock but it's not always the case because then suddenly the market is goes into some other mood and starts focusing on well the earnings are good but the guidance is bad okay so uh, it, it, so you don't know what the market is actually going to focus on from quarter to quarter or even from day to day right so as you can see here itself you can see when the when the same news when the news came it shot up but then without any real uh, change in the news and then it went back all the way down 
right? Because they were looking at other factors like supply, oversupply and all that stuff, right? So therefore that's the problem. So there, in fundamental, this is where you can see once again the difference between fundamentals and technicals. In fundamentals, we rely on the market to react in a reasonable way. That if the earnings are great, then the stock should be bought. But the market doesn't always react in that reliable way. Whereas in technicals, you don't rely on all these kinds of movements. You don't rely on the market reacting in a particular way to news. You are just looking at patterns. You're just looking at patterns. Okay. All you're saying as a technical player, what you will say here, obviously, is that this is now the development of an uptrend. So if you're if you're operating a breakout kind of system, like the Duncan breakout system, okay, or that that's a, a specific type of a breakout system. If you're operating that kind of a system, you will essentially be buying here. Okay, and you're not really concerned about whether this was based on some, you know, uh, flimsy information or not. The point is that the market traded there. So this is also an important thing to understand the difference with the films. Are you getting the feeling of what are you getting a feel for what is what I'm talking about? These are very important uh, ideas because uh, you need to understand later on when you go into the market on your own, you need to evolve a style for yourself. You'll find that many people say we use both technicals and fundamentals. There's actually a logical problem with that. But for your own sake, you should also be saying that because that's the politically correct thing to say. Okay, I've taught you that. But deep in your own mind, you have to be clear about what you really, what you really favor, what kind of method you really favor, because the approaches are very, very different. Philosophically, very, very different approaches. In technicals, you don't care about all this fundamental news, why it's going up. Okay, you just care about what's happening to the price and what pattern is being formed, right? So in technicals, what you would do is immediately uh, you would buy here and you would put a stop over here. Can you see the? Can you see the? Uh, you see the low high, the low, the highest low from which the new high was made. So here, what you would do in technicals is very clear. If you're a trend following trader, the the decision is very clear. New high is made, uptrend is established. You would go long here and you would put a stop over here. Okay, as a small, st if you wanted to keep a small stop, if you wanted to keep a really wide stop, your stop would be here. So these are the only two real possibilities. Are you following? <coughs> so you can see that technicals are, in a way, it's much simpler. Your life is much simpler if you're operating from a technical perspective. Okay, that does not mean it'll be more successful or less successful. It could go either way. All right. Okay. So good question uh, that led up to a discussion. And these things are important because later on in life, you have to make your own decision. And this is how you will decide. So your decision is going to be based on uh, how do you feel about the market? Like, I mean, what I'm telling you is that the market doesn't react rationally uh, to all, uh, you know, to the same kind of news across periods of time. But don't take my word for it. You have to come out. Don't just you can't do your own trading. You can't run your own life based on oh, what my teacher told me this. You don't accept that. You form your own view. That's why you're given access to these uh, real time data feeds. You form your own view of what you think the market is like. OK, and based on that, you take that decision. If you feel that if you feel that the market is largely irrational, OK, doesn't behave rationally, then you would be leaning more towards technicals. And if you are convinced that the market has to come back to rational pricing from time to time, then you would be leaning more towards fundamental. Are you following that? OK, so I'm not telling you which way you should go, but I'm telling you basically what is going to drive your decision. And ultimately, it, the heart of it is your own assessment and your own study of the market and what you conclude about the nature of the market. Yes. OK, so um, where were we? So the reason so uh, we were talking about stack and roll strategy, right? OK, I don't know what, how exactly we went into the uh, uh, well, okay. I think we were talking about how the price could go up. So you would essentially, uh, I'm, I'm, I've kind of lost the thread as to how we went into the discussion of the chart. Uh, but anyway, so uh, I pulled up that crude oil chart and then we talked about this assassination and all that. Okay. So uh, is everyone clear what's going on with the stack and roll strategy? Please replay the video once again and watch it. So essentially what you have to do is that you, what you do is you have total exposure of 240 contracts. Okay, let's just say 240 contracts. And this is your gonna this is gonna be a consumption in each of the forward months, and total is 240. But you feel the liquidity in it, these months is not so good. So you what you do is you buy the entire amount for 24 initially for February. Okay. Now in February, 25 contracts will roll off. 
you will take physical delivery against the 25 contracts so you are left with 240 minus 25 which is 215 okay so now you're carrying 215 long for march and remember this transaction that we did the transaction that you do do to roll over into march this is where the roll part of it comes the stacking is over here and the rolling comes from here that in 215 uh, in in feb 25 rolls up but you still have 2215 left but you can't keep it in feb because that's expiring so you roll it into march by doing you're already long feb so you want to have zero position in feb and you want to have a long position of 215 in march so you will sell and buy feb march is this clear you will sell and buy very logical because depending on what you that's why you need to have clarity about what is your goal your goal is to have zero position in feb and plus 215 in march and right now your position in feb is plus 215 so you have to do a transaction which is sell and buy 215 feb march sell and buy feb march 215 contracts yes and that is one transaction okay that's one transaction it's not treated as two separate that's a spread transaction that's one transaction this is clear and we also mentioned please go back and revise this we have also mentioned that this is structurally identical to the repo transaction please identify please uh, be clear in your own mind as to why this is structurally identical to the repo transaction okay everyone knows the repo transaction by now look at it in terms of base asset terms asset look at it in general terms in general terms what we are doing here in this futures intermonth spread this is called a futures intermonth spread okay so this will be there in your uh, futures contracts uh, note when you look at uh, the i think this note has been put in here this will be there in your futures in uh, note in any case if it's not there i'll put it in uh, you guys are following what i'm saying here this is very important to understand we're going to look at one more transaction where we should understand this will also cement your understanding of uh, contracts and transactions repo transaction look at it in terms of base asset and terms asset in a repo transaction your base asset think of the base asset as the bond that is used as a collateral yes are you following you use the bond as the base asset and think of the currency let's say you're doing it in us dollars think of the currency as the terms asset so bond in a repo transaction the us dollar markets the bond is the base asset the currency is the us dollars is the terms asset right in this case you have you will replace the bond uh, bond with the with crude oil okay you will replace bond with crude bond with crude oil or crude oil futures is the base asset okay in this case crude, crude oil will be the base asset and again dollars is the terms asset and you're doing exactly the same thing in a repo transaction what are you doing you're selling and buying the bond in one transaction selling for today selling for near date and buying for far date remember we use these terms when we did repos selling for far, selling for near date and sell, buying for far date okay that is the borrowers transaction same here in the futures intermonth spread which you are doing in these these are all spread transactions sell february by march 215 contracts sell march by april 155 contracts sell april by may 80 contracts sell 45 buy uh, sell 45 and buy 45 in uh, against may and june okay that's another uh, sorry i i uh, changed the format of my uh, of what I, how i was describing it but you understand what i'm saying right these are all identical these are all separate futures intermonth spread transactions okay so the futures intermonth spread we can call this uh, i'll just write the expression here you need to use the term very carefully always note this is intermonth spread intermonth is inter is not the same as intra because later on we will also talk about intra month spreads okay those intra month is actually uh, sorry inter month intra market we are talking about, we are going to talk about not intra month we are going to talk about inter market spreads okay so the inter month let me also clarify this is probably already there but let's make it very clear why am i saying inter month inter month includes the idea of intra market intra you understand is within okay so intra varsity means within the within the university okay inter college means between colleges okay so you can have an intra varsity intra inter college okay 
so here what we're talking about is intra market why are we saying intra market because all of this is happening in the crude oil futures market all these spread transactions are being done in the crude oil futures market we are not going from crude oil into natural gas okay or copper okay we are doing crude oil uh, within the crude oil futures market that's why and remember how is the market defined two assets <coughs> so what is not changing here is base asset crude oil terms asset us dollars that market is not changing okay instrument is futures contracts okay so that's why it's intra market because it's all within the crude oil market yes are you following but it is inter month because i am selling feb buying march selling march buying april selling april buying may so it is inter month intra market inter month okay so please go home and make sure that you understand clearly the complete structural identity of the report of the bond repo transaction and the futures inter month spread okay or and the way you are understand that the way you're going to understand that is see both in term in general terms what is the base asset and what is the terms asset and what is happening in both these transactions is you are selling the base asset or buying the base either selling buying or buying selling okay so selling buying if you are selling in the near date then you are buying on the far date if you are buying on the near date then you are selling on the far date okay so in both those cases i'm just going to use one side as an example so in this case in the case of the bond repo you are selling and buying near date against far date base asset okay i'm not going to obviously terms asset opposite stuff is happening okay so i'm just going to talk in terms of please pay attention and follow okay both the cases you are follow your let me just try and this is already there in your futures notes let me just make sure that we have it this is very important to understand conceptually you will not find this in any finance textbook okay so it is important to understand this structural identity because nobody talks about this they are discussed as separate transactions but they are actually you should understand that they are structurally identical transactions uh, i think it's in a different note but i'll put it here okay so what you're doing is um generic transaction is buy or sell base terms asset near date versus for date has everyone followed the format of my writing i could be buying uh, the base asset okay near date and therefore selling the base asset for date i could be uh, and i could you can also talk in terms of terms asset but generally we talk in terms of the base asset so if i am buying the base asset in the near date obviously i am selling the terms asset in the near date yes so this is a general transaction structure once you understand the general structure then you can apply it to whenever you see a specific kind of there's going to be there's going to be another transaction we are going to look at that is a foreign exchange swap okay an fx swap okay which is essentially a position maturity altering swap again that transaction will have the identical structure all these three transactions which are usually discussed separately okay nobody talks about their essential oneness they are absolutely identical because their basic structure is this that i'm going to talk about only about the base asset just to give you an example that you are buying and selling the base asset near date against the far date or selling and buying the base asset near date against far date okay put it in this kind of structure then you'll see that the sub transaction is the same you'll see one transaction with two dates two settlement dates near date and far date so what is happening in the case of the futures now can you see this in the case of the futures inter month spread near date far date yes so i'm selling for near date buying for far date base asset clear everyone repo is also identical same thing because i am selling the bond in the near, in the near date and buying the bond in the far date yes that's how you do borrowing through a repo right if i sell the bond then i will buy the dollars if i'm buying the dollars mean i'm getting a loan right when you take a loan money comes into your account so in the bond near date what i'm doing is selling the bond and obviously if i'm selling the bond then i'm buying the dollars that means i'm getting the dollars and in the far date i'll have to pay back the dollars with interest so i'm selling the dollars p plus i and i'm buying back the bond yes so structurally identical absolutely identical transaction okay this basic structure of this transaction is this that um, so we are going to write this as um, 
futures we can just borrow it from here where did we have that okay it's in this in this right so this I'm going to instead of writing it once again I'm just going to put it here okay and uh, bond repo and also let me write fx swap which we are not going to discuss right now fx swap all these three three transactions okay all these three are identical transactions structurally identical transactions this is how it's structured buy or sell the base asset or the terms asset near date versus far date okay and obviously it goes without saying at different prices generally at different prices some because of some peculiar situations in the market liquidity problems or dislocations you could have uh, you could have them at the same price which is essentially zero interest if i if i do a repo transaction where the near date and the far date prices are the same right that essentially means zero interest are you able to follow that always see a repo as a secured borrowing transactions so if i have now because the market dislocations as you know now in europe we have negative interest rates in japan we have negative interest rates the scandinavians also had negative interest rates right so but in general you do not expect negative interest rates but if you are able to do a bond repo where the near date price on the bond and the far date price on the bond are the same that means you're borrowing at zero interest are you following yes because your p plus i, p plus I is equal to p p is what you got on the near date by selling the bond and then at the far date on the far date you have to pay back p plus i but you find that p plus i is uh, is equal to p which means i is equal to zero right so you can have that when the market dislocation but generally we don't expect that so that's why you notice i've written i didn't initially i wrote at different prices but then i qualified it to write generally at different prices because it's not always true sometimes you can have them at the same price okay so uh, so this is basically what it is okay so it's very important to understand this transaction okay so is everyone clear now about this stack and roll and this is why we said this is why we said that uh, the decision with respect to the maturity uh, sorry yeah the decision with respect to which expiry date to use in the case of hedging with futures contracts the decision is actively solved okay because you have the possibility of doing a stack and roll instead of buying specifically against the expiration dates right so that's why it's actively solved okay next entry price next decision problem is entry price so we saw that buy sell the the buy sell decision per se is automatically solved what about entry price if we go back to our let's say we are hedging and we are going to make uh, for the moment we're going to make an assumption that uh, people with jet fuel exposures are directly hedging in the crude oil market because there isn't a very active uh, jet fuel market not as active as crude oil and not as liquid as crude oil so we're going to assume that uh, those uh, the airlines are hedging or, or we can make the simplifying assumption that they actually have to buy crude oil and put it into the aircraft okay so their exposure they're short crude oil and they're hedging in the crude oil futures markets right so what's our decision problem okay so what we saw is that their bias as to buy or sell this kind of bias that is automatically decided because if they are jet fuel if they are airlines that means they're what is their underlying position with respect to crude oil long or short yes should be if i'm an airline what is my underlying position with respect to crude oil short why one minute one minute be quiet let her answer going will go, we'll be going down no but that's not the reason no why if you want to answer why your underlying position is short what is the logic that i've taught you how do you justify that your assessment about somebody's underlying position being short is correct that when we sell the when you sell what happens no 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 this is not the right way to explain yes sg1 is my question clear 
Her answer is correct that in the, in the case of an airline, their crude oil, their exposure, we, we are just mixing, we are treating jet fuel and crude oil as the same. In the case of an airline, their exposure, underlying exposure with underlying position with respect to crude oil is short. But her justification is not correct. What is the logic I've ta taught you? It's very simple logic. We can see that Srishti also doesn't know the answer <laughs> because you don't know the answer. Okay. See, these are very simple. These are very logical things which I've taught you. Now you not even, don't even remember all this. What is the simplest answer? To, uh, how do you figure out that a person's underlying position is short? Okay. You also are not clear. Okay. So, yes, Verma, you know, right? How do you justify that the underlying position is short? Surbi is correct. Surbi is correct that the underlying position of an airline is short with respect to crude oil. But how do you justify her answer? If my underlying position is short, then I must have assumed the market is about to drop. No, 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 no. Yes, Mayak. You give her the mic. Give her the mic. <laughs> is my question clear? You you know what kind of answer what I'm looking for? I'm looking for a clear cut justification of Surbi's answer. It's not working. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. So that is the right way to justify, right? That you know that in the case of an airline, given the kind of profile that they have, their position has to be short because when crude oil prices rise, they are losing money. And when uh, so you were going to finish the second part, I stopped you. Uh, and the second part, uh, and when crude oil prices fall, they are making money. Is that clear? Is that everyone agrees with that. And then, then you ask yourself the second part of the answer is, and what kind of question, uh, what kind of position has that kind of behavior? That that when the market goes up, you make money. Uh, when you when the market goes up, you lose money. And when the market goes down, you make money. And the answer is that has to be a short position because a long position doesn't behave like that. Is this clear? Are you following? So it's a two-step logic. That's what you were going to say a second, right? Is everyone clear about this? It's very basic stuff. Okay, this is very basic stuff. But once you understand the logic, you'll never forget it. Yes, Kurvu, is it clear? I feel too long. No, but what happens if uh, so? Always go back to the airlines uh, export. What do you think about an airline? If air, if crude oil prices go up, is it good for the airline or bad for the airline? It's bad for the airline. So you can equate that to losing money. They'll actually be losing money because if they can't change ticket, if they can't change ticket prices, you know, you get these fuel charge surcharges and all that. That's because our market is not that competitive. Okay, so these guys cartelize and they sort of convince the regulator to allow that. But fuel surcharges, if it's a very competitive market, remember what did you see in price competition, in perfect competition? That you're a price taker, you can't set prices, okay? So therefore, but your costs are going up. 50% of the operating cost is crude oil expense. Okay, so your costs are going up, but you can't change your prices. Right. So what is happening to your margins? They're going down. So it's like losing money. You may not actually be losing money on an absolute basis, but it's the equivalent of losing money. Yes. Everyone agrees. And when crude oil prices go down in a in a symmetrical way, then you're making money. Okay. So that's how you should find out the answer to these questions. So you need to know the context. Obviously, if I ask you what is Norway's underlying position with respect to crude oil, you need to know that Norway is a big exporter of crude oil, right? So then you figure out, okay, if this is a big exporter, then what will happen to crude oil, uh, their PNL if crude oil prices drop, and what will happen to their crude uh, their PNL if crude oil. So this is how you have to figure it out. That you have to figure out what happens to their PNL if market if the market goes up, and if the market goes down. And then in this case of the airline, you find that when the market goes up, they lose money. When the market goes down, they'll make money. And then you say, okay, what kind of position behaves in that manner? Is it a long position or a short position? And then you can figure out that it's only the short position that behaves like that. Yes. So this is the logic. So you can see how basic this is very basic stuff. Okay. And everybody's not clear about it. So you can see why I take the phones away. Right. Okay. All right. Now, where were we? Um, yeah, so the reason I went into re we can see with this recap that people are not clear about basic stuff which has already been discussed. But the point I was trying to establish is that 
once you as far as the buy sell bias is concerned for a hedging team once you know your underlying position the buy sell decision problem is automatically solved is everyone clear about that because in hedging you have to reduce risk and if you take this uh, we take a, a purest example of a, a static hedging program that means every transaction you do has to progressively reduce risk right in a static hedging program and that's consistent with the philosophy of hedging all right so now therefore you know that for when your underlying position is long your as far as the buy sell decision is concerned it has to be sell you have so it is automatically determined but now my question is what about the entry price entry price decision problem because let's say look at look at it if i'm hedging oil, crude oil for ryanair okay if i'm on the hedging team and i see crude oil prices are shooting up okay now i have to take a view at some point i know that i have to sell i, I know that i have to buy because my underlying position is short okay i have to buy now the question is when do i buy do i now that this thing has come with all this very scary fundamental news has come out the price is also behaving in a uh, in a scary manner the price is shooting up making new highs should i buy it now if i buy it now immediately if i this is now the question of entry price am i going to enter at market am i going to enter with a limit order remember go back to the same way of solving these problems entering with a limit order or a stop order or a market order yes yes this is clear so though the same problem i have now even as a member of a hedging team should i enter with a market order if i'm entering with a market order that means my view is that this stuff is going to shoot up right away i'm not going to get a chance to buy it at a slightly lower price or anything okay like what happened here it shot up initially and then it came all the way uh, you know slowly sliding down this is not going to happen this is going to shoot up all the way above 68 70 72 whatever if i hedge at market if i buy right now okay uh, should i enter at market at the market price or at a less favorable price or a more favorable price that decision has to be taken right is everyone clear so if i buy at market that's my view if i wait if i don't buy it now i know i have to buy it but i don't buy it now because i feel that uh, whatever happened here the same thing is going to happen it's just going to shoot up initially in a panic reaction and then it will start declining like this it will start slipping down and then i'll get a better chance to buy maybe around 56 or 57 or something right so if i think i can buy at 57 why should i buy at 63 right is this clear so now coming back to the question or otherwise the other thing that that i could do to discuss the full range of options once again first is the market order if i'm afraid that it's going to shoot up right away significantly higher then i should use a market order and enter the market right now okay that is buy right now if i feel that this particular rally is very going to be short-lived and it's going to come down later on and then i'll get a chance to buy at a low then i'll use a limit order yes okay recapping all your previous concepts but if i feel that the other thing is that i feel that this is there's no real big risk on the oil price unless it goes above this high which is here which seems to be around 67 let's say 67 okay so unless it goes above 67 if i feel that now the mic has already uh, gone conked out yeah okay we can use the hand mic let's try and yeah okay all right so once again we are recapping so those concepts so please be clear if you've forgotten your uh, active risk book concepts the concepts do not change as far as the entry price is concerned okay once you've made your buy sell decision and all that the entry price is concerned you go back to the same framework at the market uh, at current market prices then you use a market order at a price more favorable than the current market then you use a limit order and it's less if you if it's less favorable than the current market then you use a stop order okay same framework applies so here even the hedging team could use a stop order because they might have a and it all depends on your market views so the hedging team might have a view that okay this particular blip in the price we are not really concerned about because we feel that unless the price clears 67 there's no significant risk of upside in oil prices that could be your view in this case what kind of order will you use to buy yes in this case it will be a stop order 
because what are you saying you're saying if the the real significant risk of upside in oil prices comes if the price goes above 67 right so if there is 60 if, if 67 is broken then there's a risk of a very sharp rally in oil prices maybe to 70 80 100 80 100 etc so at that time you want to be fully covered that means you want to be fully hedged okay so you want to buy your entire exposure at that time so if if the market right now is at 63 and you really want to buy only if the market goes to 67 right so 67 is uh, for, for from a buyer's perspective 67 is less favorable or more favorable than 60, 63 yes. less favorable right so you are planning to buy at a less favorable price less favorable than the current market so which kind of order are you going to use stop order right so you'll have a buy stop for whatever 240 contracts whatever that exposure is you'll have a 240 stop uh, 240 contract buy stop order at 67 is this clear we are recapping all our methods from before okay you can see that there's a lot of similarity as well uh, there's a lot of similarity between active risk books and passive risk books but it's not identical there are some important differences okay and this is another reason why uh, i have taught you the general decision problems because there are a lot of similarities between the two in most mba programs you'll see risk management is handled as a separate silo as a separate uh, category of courses okay it's a separate course but actually that's why i teach it as a continuum because many of the principles are the same you can just see some small differences okay all right so uh, we go back to our yeah so is everyone clear now that the entry price decision is as Tarun pointed out is actively solved yes because the hedging team has the option the hedging team is looking at the situation they know that it's an airline they're short crude oil the underlying position is short crude oil so they have to buy but the entry price the they, so they have to go along as far as the buy sell decision is concerned the answer is buy but the entry price decision has to be actively solved because even if they are going to be buying there's still a decision to be taken as to should we buy right at now at the right now at the current market should we buy at a price less favorable than the current market using a stop order or more favorable than the current market using a limit order is this clear is everyone clear about this why there's a difference that buy sell sg1 is not clear what is not not clear that uh, buy sell part is automatic that is clear yes. because if you're an airline your underlying position is short so your hedging trend your hedge transaction has to be a sale your hedge position that you create has to be a short position because in hedging you have to reduce your risk okay we are we are going to have most of our discussion with respect to static hedging program because that is a classical form of hedging okay so um, that is clear you have to be a seller and yes. uh, if your underlying position is long uh, in this case your underlying position is short you have to be a buyer but buyer still leaves you the question even though you know you have to buy you still have an option do you have to buy right now or do you want to wait and you think it's going to come down a little bit low uh, it will come down a little bit it'll, you'll get a more favorable price or are you not at all worried about this you are only concerned if it goes above 67 so you still have to take that decision okay i think it becomes a little clearer i think some of uh, some other some other people maybe also because this again you will not see uh, this kind of a discussion in a fundamental based course now once you look at this it becomes a little clearer we are looking at crude oil yeah see the this this situation that the buy sell decision problem is automatically solved okay however the entry price decision problem is not automatically solved so the buy sell decision problem is automatically solved but the entry price decision problem is not automatically solved that distinction becomes much clearer once you start looking at the market in multiple time frames Remember, I've told you to look at it in multiple time frames. So you have a long-term trend, medium-term trend, short-term trend, etc. Right? So maybe let's say that the the uh, the hedging team is operating. The main decision problems, the main uh, decisions are being taken with respect to uh, the long-term trend. Okay? So if you look at this example, so I'll just give you an example that if you look at uh, something like this. Um, okay so if you look at this let's say this this particular chart this is a, the weekly chart okay here you can see the same level that i pointed out this 67 level okay this this same level this one is the same as this thing here all right so 
you remember the top the, you remember when I told you about operating when you're taking views on markets you look at because you can actually have charts with different data ranges right these are all what is this what is the difference between these charts they're all the market is the same but the data range keeps getting smaller as you move like this as you keep moving from here to here the data range keeps getting smaller and the last value is always the current market price are you following the structure of these charts we have discussed this before okay so this is a common way of looking at markets especially if you are operating with a technical perspective okay this is a and even if you're not operating from a technical perspective you should still look at it this way because then you can see the different degrees of trend and where the market is because remember this data is all objective it's 100 percent objective data so that's useful to look at even if you're not a technical analyst so all is what is happening in these charts you have the same market the end point is always the same but the data range keeps getting smaller as you move from here to here and then down okay the data range keeps getting smaller are you following yeah. so which means it's as if you're zooming in right it's just like it's progressively zooming in to the price action right that kind of view so you could have the hedging team might have formed its view about significant the risk of significant upside by looking at this degree of chart they're looking at this degree of chart okay and here they feel that uh, as soon as this because they're looking at this low this low so one higher low and then they have a high here or you can look at this you can zoom into this part here you can see this part is zoomed in over here so they may have looked at this and said okay this is a low here this is a second low here and then this is the first high after this low and then if it goes above this then there'll be a second high are you following okay so then there'll be two highs a higher highs you have higher highs and higher lows right so the hedging team might have looked at this degree of movement and decided that if it goes above 67 only then do we have a risk okay and so what they do is they're also looking at the short-term uh, movement and they look at this kind of uh, the, then they look at the detail of this move okay and then they feel that this thing is not going to go straight up and break above 67 it's now likely to come back they can look at this particular movement and take a view that this will actually come back to around 57 or so before it eventually goes above 67 Be before it eventually goes above so this is based on your view you don't have to always do it that way but i'm just trying uh, what, I, what we are pointing out is possibilities okay remember the reason we said that the future's expiration date the choice of expiration date is actively solved the reason we said that is because because there is a chance that it might be actively solved there is a chance that you might actually do a stack and roll hedge are you following what I'm saying if at any point you don't follow what I'm saying because I may speak in long complicated sentences because I want to make sure that whatever I'm saying is very clear and cor is actually correct and you know small changes like that generally at the same price all those things I'm very particular about what I'm saying so it may seem very complicated if you don't understand please ask okay so uh, the uh, what they might do so there is a possibility that they may actually take this view that this is this is the real risk point and this particular movement now is not going to sustain it's not going to go straight above 67 but in fact it will come down to around 56 or so before it starts it might start to move up are you following this is all a view that you have to take about the markets remember that that's why i told you that everything you do in a finance role is going to be based eventually on taking views on markets whether you're raising equity capital or raising debt capital everything is based on market timing okay what kind of performance you can show is going to be based on your mark ability to time the markets right so therefore you have to take a view on the market so they may take this view so because the possibility exists that they may take this view that's why you have to treat this decision problem as actively solved okay they could also just simplify their life and say that whatever we decide to do buy or sell we are just going to do everything at market okay that means that is a decision you can take but the point is you do have the choice to use either a stop order or a limit order or a market order you do have the choice uh, but you could also decide to do it or everything at market in this case the decision problem but you're still so decision problem of uh, the uh, decision problem of uh, let me just go back to that listing here yeah so the entry price decision problem is still being actively solved even for somebody who says that i'm only going to use market orders 
So once I decide that uh, you can even have it built into your risk management policy, that once you decide that you have to buy and sell or buy or sell, and that is very clear from the underlying positions, which means to see this becomes a situation where a company, if you decide that your buy your entry price decision is always going to be using a market order, that means it's a company which immediately hedges everything. Are you following? Because you already know your underlying position based on what business you're doing. So let's say Infosys signs a big contract with, let's say, uh, Exxon Mobil in the US. And let's say it's a uh, $50 million contract. And then the money comes in. The moment they sign the contract, they know the money is coming. Uh, $50 million is coming after one year, right? That means the exposure has, the underlying position has been created. Once the contract is signed, okay they know that after one year they're going to receive 50 million dollars yes <coughs> so their infosys uh balance pnl uh, statement uh, financial statements are in rupees right <coughs> so in this particular case what is infosys's uh, underlying position now with respect to the dollar rupee what is happening shuchi and uh parul and all your call you're right doing not self crosses on some combined board uh, okay look just sit straight okay sit straight and look shuchi seems to be concentrating on parul's uh, sheet okay 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 all right okay fine no problem okay all right okay so let's do a quick recap yes let's ask parul since she has the notes okay in this particular case <coughs> in this particular case infosys let's say that infosys has a policy of entry uh, entry price is always going to be solved as market price we are not going to use stop orders or limit orders as soon as the position uh, as soon as the exposure arises we will hedge the entry prices decision of entry price will always be uh, decided the decision problem will always be decided or solved by choosing to execute at the mark current market price okay now this example of a contract they get a contract from exxon mobil where after one year they'll be receiving 50 million dollars their balance sheet currency is rupees okay so now my question is um, as soon as the contract is signed the exposure arises clear are you clear about that contract is signed ordinarily you expect contracts to be honored okay so therefore the exposure has now come into being so now my question is at this point what is infosys's underlying position with respect to dollar rupee the dollar rupee fx rate is my question clear once the contract is signed and the exposure is clear clear okay uh, what is their underlying position with respect to dollar rupee is it long or short they are going to receive 50 million dollars from exxon mobil because of the contract after one year is everyone clear about the contract please uh, please think because later on i'm coming to ask srishti sukriti questions will be asked please think about the answer is the question clear to everyone as soon as you sign the contract the exposure arises and your we haven't even come to the second part my first question is then what is your exposure if your info says what is your exposure with respect to dollar rupee <laughs> No, we talk about it as dollar rupee because when you talk about the international markets or the uh, the, the the standard way of trading dollar rupee, okay, just like the standard way of trading cable is with sterling as the base currency. But the standard way of trading dollar rupee, just like dollar Swiss, dollar Canada, okay, is with dollar as the base currency. So when we talk about the USD INR exchange rate, we talk about the dollar, we call it dollar rupee, okay, not rupee dollar. But mathematically, you can say there's no difference. Right, so let's look at this as a long term chart. Right, so yes, Parul, now imagine how do you, when you get a question like this, how do you answer the question? You immediately ask yourself, what happens to the entity? if the market goes up because we are discussing what are we discussing always the general framework of the question is what is an entity's underlying position with respect to a particular market right that is the general framework of the question right so entity here is infosys 
and the market is dollar rupee i pulled out a dollar rupee chart for you to help you to make the decision now what question are you supposed to ask yourself quiet quiet be quiet yeah if the price goes up whether we make the money or not whether we make money or not and if the price goes down what happens when we we make money or not okay now answer that question for yourself let's say the dollar rupee goes up what happens is it good for infosys or bad be quiet be quiet is the dollar rupee Money goes up. Dollar rupee, not money. Dollar. If the dollar rupee rate goes up or the dollar rupee goes up, just say dollar rupee goes up because that's a market. Yeah. If the dollar rupee goes up, it's good for Infosys. Yes, sir. Why? Be quiet here, guys. Be quiet. I want to hear a detailed answer. Huh? How will they make money? How will it make money? Can you spell it out? Even though I'm like a computer, I don't understand your logic. Can you explain it clearly? One minute. Okay, good. So, uh, 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 even more precise way of saying it, what she already said it, that the value of the dollar is rising, which means each dollar is going to buy more and more rupees. Yes, okay. Now, you may see, this, you may think this is very so simple, it's almost idiotic, but this is how you should teach yourself how to think, so that you explain it. You're always thinking of how you explain it to a computer. This forces your logic to be very clear because computers don't understand anything you have to explain everything to them in mathematical terms that each dollar is now buying more rupees okay so when they sell that dollar they'll make more rupees in their balance sheet currency yes okay so parul has established that uh, infosys is long dollar rupee now if infosys has a hedging policy okay if infosys has a, has a hedging policy which requires the hedging team as far as the entry price, because when you have a hedging policy for a company, you'll have to address all these decision problems. What is the hedging policy document? That is a document which formalizes the answers to each of these questions. What should we do about uh, entry price? How should we solve futures expiration dates? All these answers are formalized. And then the hedging team has to follow those guidelines. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. Right? So if the InfoSage hedging policy document says that as far as the decision of the entry price is concerned, it is always to be solved by choosing a market order. Okay, that means the exposure is to be immediately hedged at the current market prices. If they if they're in that is a choice they have as a company. They could leave it to the decision uh, discretion of the hedging team. Then, okay, guys, you can use based on your judgment about the market. You can use a market order, limit order, stop order based on your view on the market. Okay, view of the market. Or they could also company could all, a very conservative company could also decide to say no discretion. As soon as the exposure arises, you have, uh, you know the buy sell side. You have to uh, the entry price decision has to be solved by using a market order, which means you have to hedge immediately at market. So in this, if that is the case, if that is the case, then in this particular case, Infosys will immediately, the hedging team will, as soon as the exposure arises, they will immediately have to, what, sell or buy dollars, forward dollars. Yes. Now, Shristi, you can tell us what will they do if the hedging policy requires immediate hedging at market prices. So in this case, what will they do? What will be the hedge transaction? Is my question clear? Because Parul has established the underlying position. Okay, now related to that is the concept of hedge transaction and hedge position. Remember that? Be careful about all these terms. Hedge transaction is sale or purchase. Hedge position is short or long. So hedge transaction, what will be the hedge transaction in this case? Sell. Okay. Is this clear to everyone? In this case, so if you have so remember that actually the entry price decision is actively solved because if uh, you in general you will have the discretion to use any type of order but if a company locks in its hedging team to force and forces them to hedge using market orders it means that as soon as the exposure arises everything is hedged 100 percent this is clear this is the most it, it's also useful to understand this approach because it gives you the most conservative benchmark for hedging this is as conservative as it gets so this company does not carry any risk as soon as the exposure arises everything is hedged 100 percent 
okay nothing wrong with that that's also a policy and this you can understand that this is like one side you you understand one uh, you know like one extreme end of the spectrum like a pure vegetarian okay uh, doesn't eat eggs or doesn't eat other kinds of even marginal products okay so that's an example of uh, uh, you know one kind of approach so you get one extreme approach uh, which you can see as a benchmark okay is everyone clear about this now entry price right actively solved exit price again will be split into what will happen with the exit price let's assume that in this case of market order if it's if we assume that the, this thing is solved using a market order this becomes more complicated to discuss because it's not complicated in itself but there will be many many scenarios so we take one scenario that assuming that the market order is used to hedge okay in the case of an exit price what will happen exit price with loss and if we discuss it because remember this this uh, discussion now can give rise to many scenarios using depending on whether you're using a static program or a dynamic hedging program is this clear okay but we are going to discuss it only with respect to a static program to keep our life simple so that you understand and further we're going to further simplify it by making the assumption that the previous decision problem with respect to entry price has been solved using using a market order in this case in this particular case uh, which is only one of the possible scenarios where in this case what happens to this if you are running a static hedging program and you have hedged everything uh, and the entry price is solved by choosing a market order so the position is the exposure is hedged immediately is there any decision to be taken with respect to exit price exit price with loss let's start with exit price with loss is my question clear if you are running a static hedging program okay and if you are also uh, using if you have also got a policy of using market orders with respect to the entry price which means essentially that as soon as the exposure arises it is hedged hundred percent right that's what we saw in the case of Infosys hundred percent hedging instantaneously as soon as the exposure arises in this case having done this is there any further decision to be taken uh, with respect to exit price with loss yes so Tarun is correct there is no decision to be taken because you're running a static hedging program are you following you're running a static hedging program so there's nothing else to be done because once you what is the characteristic of a static hedging program yeah so you never once you hedge you never unhedge you never unhedge uh, whatever part of the exposure you have hedged and in this case we have talked about market order uh, we in the previous decision we have essentially we have taken extreme case of a very conservative company which hedges everything hundred percent as soon as the exposure arises as soon as the exposure arises they hedge everything 100 percent and they're also running a static hedging program so therefore it follows that there is no decision to be taken with respect to exit price with loss once you have hedged it so here actually a hedging team has no real in this kind of example of where we are forcing the entry price to be decided in favor of a market order here you really don't need very sophisticated uh, analytics in the hedging team because it's almost automatic okay you just need to be able to figure out which way the underlying position is that will tell you which way the hedge transaction is as Shristi pointed out okay based on the underlying position information from Barul then this going to, if it's the long if it's an underlying position is long then the hedge transaction has to be a sale okay so that in this kind of a extreme example you should be able to see this also as a benchmark of a pure example of an extremely conservative hedging approach an extremely conservative approach where uh, there is basically in this kind of a situation you don't need very sophisticated market analytics and the and the hedging team because they're not going to be taking a view on the market right there's nothing to take no view to take no market view to be taken because all you need to know is to be able to figure out the logic of what your underlying position is and then you know immediately that you have to do the opposite yeah, and in the hedge portfolio and the rule says that you have to do it at market prices your company's risk management policy requires that you have to hedge the entry price decision has to be solved by choosing market orders and 100 percent hedging with market orders 
and therefore that's it basically you don't need to do any you don't need to take a view on the market yes are you clear okay but in fact of course most companies don't operate like this maybe a few of them do but most companies don't operate like this they use some discretion in uh, in in when to hedge how much to hedge okay so that's why i say that in most finance roles that you will actually take up in, in industry you will be required to take some kind of view on the market because that's what most companies do but it's useful to have the pure, pure idea of the uh, extremely conservative approach to hedging which is a hundred percent hedging as soon as the exposure arises which means essentially in terms of this that the exit uh, the entry price is decided by uh, problem is solved by choosing market orders yes yes sir no there's we still have four minutes okay so is this point clear that once you if you are taking a pure example we are only going to discuss a few scenarios because otherwise we'll have to go into so many scenarios because we can look at we can look at depending on how it whether it was using a, a bit theaters limit order stop order static hedging program Program, passive hedging program so we're not going to do all that but we're just taking this pure example of a very conservative approach so in the same case static hedging program uh, is there any decision to be static hedging program with entry price solved by choosing market orders is there any decision to be taken in terms of exit price with profit is there a decision problem here i mean is this decision problem is there but is it automatically solved or is it act doesn't need to be actively solved when you have a static hedging program automatically solved because again static hedging program whether your hedge is making a profit or a loss you can't do anything to it you can't touch it <coughs> right so it is automatically solved are you able to see this what what we mean by automatically solved okay so you're able to see also the connection between the reason I'm using the same list is that you're able to see the connection between an active risk book and a passive risk book and how there are some small differences in terms of decision problems which ones get automatically solved and which ones have to be actively solved yes okay one minute so we do have in fact we have two minutes okay so exit now what is the other one any other decision problems left okay if this is the because since we've copied it from the we have copied it from the active risk book uh, framework right when it comes to exit price with profit there are additional decision problems with respect to the initial exit price and then we talked about pyramiding and all that remember we had these all these calculations if you want to add to your position those problems arise okay so we will not discuss these further for this because again it will complicate the scenarios but i think you get the flavor of what is happening with each of these decision problems are you able to understand what is going on yeah. that some of these decision problems which arise in active risk books when it comes to passive risk books, some get automatically solved because of the fact that it's a passive risk book yes, against which you're running a hedge portfolio right and some have to be actively solved everyone clear please make sure you revise okay those who are looking blank must make sure that they revise okay your class is dismissed so today I've given you a time a minute extra to make up for all the time I gave you 40 seconds 20 seconds extra <laughs>